Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's presentation is titled Combating the Prison Industrial Complex. Uh, we have uh, two distinguished guests with us today. We have uh, Professor Renford Reese and Professor Tai Griffith, who will be speaking on this topic. This event is sponsored by the Racial Justice Initiative and the Justice Education Initiative. So oftentimes when I tell people I'm affiliated with both the RJI and Justice Education, people say, well, what's the difference? Aren't they the same thing? And in many ways, that, that's a really good point because they're both so interrelated. You can't do or speak about racial justice without talking about the criminal justice system. You can't talk about the criminal justice system without talking about uh, racial justice. And so our guest today will be talking about the intersection of racial justice and the criminal justice system. And more importantly, they're going to be speaking about their, their uh, really, as the title suggests, their lessons from the front lines. They've been uh, involved with these issues for many, many years. They're veterans, and uh, they have, you know, maybe uh, you know, earned their stripes, combat experience, and uh, so they can share those stories with us today. Well, let me introduce our guests. First, we have Professor Renford Reese. Professor Reese received his PhD in public policy from the University of Southern California School of Public Policy, Planning and Development. He conducted his dissertation research on ethnic conflict and intergroup relations at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development in Geneva, Switzerland. He received his master's degree in public policy from Vanderbilt Institute for Public Policy Studies and his bachelor's degree in political science from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Reese is in his 25th year as a professor in political science at Cal Poly Pomona. He teaches courses on the criminal justice system and nonprofit management. He has been the faculty coordinator of 17 study abroad programs in 10 countries at Cal Poly Pomona. He is a former guest columnist for the Los Angeles Daily News and the author of 10 books. Dr. Reese is a former Fulbright fellow lecturing in the American Studies program at the University of Hong Kong. He is the founder, director of the Prison Education Project, the Reintegration Academy, and the Colorful Flags Program. I'm sure you'll be speaking about those programs today. Uh, Reese produced five documentaries that have won various film festival awards. He has developed prison education initiatives in Uganda, London, and Scotland. He mentored Rodney King in the late 1990s. The South African concept of Ubuntu, humanity, I hope I said that right, uh, is integrated throughout Reese's work, I am because we are. A fun fact about Dr. Reese is that he is one of the only professors in the nation who has participated in the NFL combine. Next, we have uh, also someone that's that's uh, affiliated with football, uh, Professor Tai Griffith, although that's not in her bio, I think it should be, uh, Professor Tai Griffith. She is the founding manager of the Justice Education Initiative at the Claremont Colleges, the coordinator for the Reintegration Academy, an original volunteer with the Prison Education Project. She is a doctoral student in political science and government in the Department of Government at Claremont Graduate University and an adjunct faculty member in political studies here at Pitzer College. She earned her master's degree in public administration with an emphasis in social policy from Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology with an emphasis in law and society from Cal State LA. Tai has worked in the justice system for nearly 20 years and has over 15 years of experience in higher education. She has taught in five California prisons, two juvenile facilities and four international prisons. Her research focuses on the criminalization of black people in the US recidivism and reentry services for formerly incarcerated individuals, and the use of education as a tool for rehabilitation and community empowerment. Her goal is to develop programs and legislation that dismantle the prison industrial complex while expanding educational opportunities to underserved and underrepresented communities. So welcome uh, both Professor Tai and Professor Reese, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Adrian. The first thing I want to do is just uh, let everyone who is in the audience know that I, I want to be brief. I want to make this as interactive as possible. I've learned my lesson about giving long-winded talks, long-winded lectures. When I first started teaching at Cal Poly Pomona, I was lecturing and a young man in the front row was asleep. And I turned to the guy beside him. I said, John, wake him up. And John said, no, you wake him up. 
you put him to sleep. <laughs> so, so I don't want to, I don't want to put our audience to sleep. I want to try to make this as uh, interactive as possible. Uh, Tai and I will go back and forth with this. Uh, someone said, May said the best story ever, <laughs> and you've probably heard it 10 times. Uh, but so I want to go back and forth with uh, Tai. But I want to start by talking about my, really my involvement, my journey in looking at social justice, but not just social justice in the United States, but, but throughout the world. And as Adrian mentioned in the introduction, I've been fortunate to have taken 17 groups of students on study abroad programs to 10 different countries. And if I could share my uh, slide, my PowerPoint slide with you, I realized that on my third trip to Africa, I've traveled to Africa 14 times. And on my third trip to Africa, I started to understand the burden and the pain and the trauma that is in the DNA of people of the African diaspora. On this trip, I was in Ghana and I asked these young men, they were about 17, 18 years old. I told them to come in and speak to my 25 students from Cal Poly Pomona. Just come and talk to them, tell them about you know, what you know about America, right? what you like about America. And all of these five, these five youth, all of them lionized and romanticized and looked up to rappers in the United States. And then I asked him, I said, tell me something about your heritage, your background. And the first person said, my name is Kwaizi. I am from Kumasi. I'm Ashanti. My mother's Ashanti, my father's Ashanti. I speak the language of Chui. My family has lived in the Kumasi region for over 500 years. The next person said, my name is Kwame. I am Ga, my mother's Ga, my father's Ga. I speak the language of Ga. My family has lived in the Volta region for over 500 years. And at some point during this, this forum, this panel, I said, time out. You have it twisted, upside down, inside out, convoluted. You're lionizing and looking up to the African-American rappers, but the fact is that they've been derooted. They're dangling. You might be poor in your pocket, but you're rich in your heritage. Your families have lived in the same villages for over 500 years. You have your own mother tongue. All African-Americans speak English, 100%. And English comes from England, the land of the colonizer. So just by speaking English, African-Americans have a colonized mindset. So while in Ghana, I was able to understand Again, the legacy of trauma, the legacy of oppression, not just by reading about it in a history book, but, but understanding the people, the heritage, the disconnect. All of this happened from, if you follow the cursor, from Senegal all the way down 3,000 miles down to Angola. That's where the slave trade took place. You know, people talk about Black History and Black History Month. I don't think we can talk about Black history unless we go back to the hinterlands of Africa. So in Africa, on this 3,000 miles from, from, from Senegal all the way down to Angola, the slave traders would go in the hinterlands. They would go to Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Burkina Faso, and walk slaves, in some cases, 600 miles down to a place called Asin Manso, Slave River, the last place that these slaves could bathe before they were marched on to Elmina, to the Cape Coast, about 30 miles away. Elmina is the first permanent structure built for the slave trade south of the Sahara Desert. The Portuguese built Elmina in 1482. And so when you go into Elmina, 
It's a castle, a slave depot. The thing about Elmina is that when you go in, you learn that they held this, this, they had this holding cell that held 200 slaves at one time, one hole on the right side for ventilation. So imagine having 200 slaves that stayed in this 1,000 square foot place for over three months. On the other side of Elmina, they held the, the women. On this side, this, this room held the men. On the other side, they held the women. And in that slave holding cell, they would bring the women out and they would shower them, spray them off. And you would have the captain and his soldiers, the slavers, who would have Vesper, who would have fellowship, who would read the Bible and pray together. And after they prayed, the captain would come down, look down, and find the one woman that he wanted. He would take this woman, get her escorted to his quarters, he would rape the woman and then give this woman to the rest of the soldiers for them to rape. But yet it was the African who, who was supposed to be the savage. And so after they left this holding cell, they went down to this ironclad door called the door of no return. One can only think about literally hundreds of thousands of Africans leaving their motherland. 12.5 Africans, 12.5 million Africans from 1525 to 1866 left the continent. Only 10.7 million survived. The rest died because of scurvy, dysentery, dehydration. Contrary to popular belief, out of that 10.7 million, only about 335,000 made it to the shores of North America. Most of those Africans were shipped to South America, to Brazil and to the Caribbean countries, the Caribbean regions. When they got to North America, we know through Alex Haley, the best-selling novel Roots, written in 1976, turned into a miniseries by one of my mentors, David Whooper, in 1977. This was one of the most pivotal moments of my childhood. In 77, I was in the second grade. And I remember seeing the rawness and, 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 and the candor of roots. And the most memorable episode in roots is the revolves around the photo that you see now. Kota Kente had run, he was a protagonist in this. He had come from the Gambia. He had run away trying to escape slavery. And the master had the overseer Ames punish Kunta. So they string him up to about 12 feet. And not only does Ames punish Kunta, what he wants to do is he wants to transform him. He wants to break him. So with every lash that he gives Kunta, he says, I'm going to change your name to Toby. Toby is a good name, it's an American name. And so with every lash, he asks Kunta what his name is. And Kunta said, Kunta Kente. So he lashes him again. And I would imagine after about 40 lashes, Kunta finally relents. He finally capitulates and he says, my name is Toby. Well, Ames is shocked. He says, say it again. He said, my name is Toby. And then he calls all the villagers in. He said, I want to hear you. I want to hear, I want to hear it again. I want everyone, everyone to see how a bad N word is turned good. So Kunta said, my name is Toby. When he broke, when Ames broke Kunta, he broke that village. And when he broke that village, he broke a people. And it was at this point, a watershed moment in American history, that the African was no longer African. And some would argue never fully accepted as Americans. 
So what you have again is an identity crisis. Who is this person? What is their identity? If you go to any third grade class in America and you ask that third grader to bring something back, some artifact back from your great, great grandparents heritage on your mother's side. Everyone in that classroom can bring something back from Mexico, El Salvador, Germany, France, England, except for the African-American third grader. So this fortifies this person in this maelstrom of an identity complex. This is where I want to start. And then we're gonna go from, from this, and, and the theme of my talk is from shackles to shackles. Where you have aims and you have the politicalization of the black body. So you go from Kunta to, you, to the thir three, three fifths amendment. Then you go from the three fifths amendment that says that for, for political purposes, blacks represent three fifths of a human being. And you go fast forward up to the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment. All of those amendments are about black, the black body. It was my classmate at Vanderbilt, Michelle Alexander, the author of the great book, The New Jim Crow, who said that there are more Africans in prison today than were enslaved in 1850. So my talk, the theme of my talk is from shackles to shackles. What has really changed? The more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. Okay, Ty. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reese. I am so fortunate and privileged to have not only uh, received great mentorship from Dr. Reese, but also to be uh, one of his mentees, one of his graduate students, um, and just to hear these, these messages. And it's, it's profoundly changed me. And so exactly what Dr. Reese is talking about, these, these broken communities and these broken people, that's my story, right? That's my story. I grew up in a community that was broken, a community that had an identity complex a community that was plagued with gun violence and drugs and gangs. And I witnessed so many of my friends, my family members, people go into prison, go into jail. And so for me, I've been involved in, in justice education really my whole life. I can remember as a, as a child, you know, going to visit people at various California prisons on the weekend. And so to think about the fact that we have this system that really is meant to, in my opinion, break down Black people. And we have to be intentional. And so when I talk about being intentional, I'm thinking about that child that I was growing up and seeing this violence, growing up and witnessing domestic violence in my home. You get to a point where you no longer need to be oppressed because you become a vehicle of your own oppression. And that was the route that I was heading. I dropped out of high school at 15 years old, you know, thinking that I knew what life was about. And it was because I had these everyday examples of this is how you have to be tough. This is how you have to get by. This is how you have to move in, in this society. And it wasn't until I myself ended up in juvenile hall that I realized this is not the route that I wanna go in life. And so, you know, Dr. Reese's story in the beginning is so touching to me because I feel that so many people that we deal with that are currently incarcerated, that are formerly incarcerated, have come from these broken communities where they are literally doing what they can to survive, not thinking about next year, not thinking about five years from now, but really thinking about today and remaining in that constant state of survival mode. And so for me, being involved in justice education, going and giving back is something very personal to me. It's very personal to me because I was those people. When I was, the last time I was in juvenile hall, I was 15 and I was pregnant. I had dropped out of high school and it was because someone inside that facility cared enough about me to want to help me 
to tell me the things that they, see, that, that, they, that they saw in me, things that I didn't see in myself. And so when we talk about not only this broken community, you know, we also need to talk about the fact that we have very few mentors left in these communities. I literally went from elementary to middle school to high school, not having one black teacher. Believe it or not, Dr. Reese was my very first black teacher. How did I have to get all the way to college to have a black professor, right? And so when you have these types of situations where you don't see that representation, where you don't see that support, where you come into those classroom spaces and you have teachers that don't look like you, that demonize every little thing that you do, it pushes a lot of kids out of the educational system and into the criminal justice system. And so I'd love to ask Dr. Reese, um, talking a bit about, you know, shackle to shackle. Uh, I have been on the front lines with Dr. Reese, working with the Prison Education Project, the Reintegration Academy. And so for me, I think I wanna know about your vision, just even in beginning these programs, because they have fundamentally changed and shaped my life in so many great ways. And so, you know, when I think about you, Dr. Reese, I, I know that you're a visionary. Uh, and where did the idea come from in terms of wanting to create the Prison Education Project and the Reintegration Academy? Well, well, thank you, Ty. And thank you. Your, your story is so uh, powerful and inspirational. But I want to just show you, when you ask where did this come from, I wrote a book back in 2006 called Prison Race. And the thesis of the book is that there is, it, it is a double entendre, that there is a, a, a race to incarcerate, there has been a race to incarcerate over the past three decades. But there is one race who has been, that has been disproportionately impacted by unjust criminal justice policies. And so before this book, I had written a book called American Paradox, Young Black Men. And the in-custody population started reading this, this book and started spreading like wildfire. And then I, I came back two years later and wrote Prison Race. And so I remember being on PBS and there was a woman by the name of Val Zavala. She was interviewing me. She was right here at my loft on, on uh, Gary and Mission in Pomona. And she said, well, Dr. Reese, how do we know the criminal justice system is biased? I said, Val, let's do, let's do, let's do a test. Let's, let's, let's not talk about it in the abstract. Let's take the Rockefeller law in New York that was passed in the early 1970s. The Rockefeller law says if you're possessing, if you're caught possessing two ounces of narcotics, if you're caught selling one ounce, you get 15 years to life in prison for your first offense. I said, let's, let, let, let's, let's do this, Val. Let's go, to, let's go to Harvard, let's go to Yale, let's go to U, USC, UCLA, and let's lock up every student that is possessing two ounces of narcotics. That's even marijuana. And let's lock them up for 15 years of life. If we did it today, there would be a revolution tonight. Why? Because these are the policymakers' kids. But if you're not going to lock that sophomore biology major up from Harvard 15 years of life, why are you going to lock the inner city kid up 15 years of life? That's somebody's potential engineer, somebody's potential journalist, somebody's potential neurosurgeon. But we look at the kids, these kids as being incorrigible. And I always tell this story, Ty. If you really want to use an example, it's an example of two people, two youth, two young men. They're right here on Gary and Mission in, in Pomona. They're both 19 years old. One is African-American. He runs down, jogs down, snatches a woman's purse, and he runs back to his homeboys. They give each other high fives, and they laugh. The next young man, he's 19 years old. He's a fraternity uh, guy at UCLA. He goes. He jogs down, he snatches the woman's purse. He comes back to his, his frat brothers. They laugh, they give each other high fives. And when the police come on the scene, this is where bias 
seeps into the system from the very outset. From the first word the police writes in his, his report, this is where the bias starts. So the police characterizes the African-Americans incident as strong armed robbery. He characterizes the UCLA young man's incident as purse snatching. So when these two reports go to the DA, the DA looks at one and he gives the first, the African-American young man, five years, 80% for strong arm robbery. He looks at the characterization of the other report that said he was just having fun. It was a prank. And he gives this young man 100 hours of community service, right? And so we can go from there. And in this book, I talk about the drug laws. In this interview, I talked about the drug laws where blacks make up 13% of all illicit drug users, but they make up 35% of those arrested for drug use or drug offenses. They make up 55% of those who are convicted of drug offenses and 74% of those incarcerated for drug offenses are African-American. So my question is, how do we go from 13, 14% of all illicit drug users to 74% of those convicted if the system is fair. In some states like Florida, 80% of those in prison for drug offenses are African-American. So what we have and what you see, Ty, is a country that has noble principles, but ignoble practices. It was King who says, we just want you America to be who you say you are on paper. It's not the laws, it's the application of laws. Because what would happen is in the Rockefeller situation, you could say, well, that, that, that law is too draconian. Well, it wouldn't take you long to understand it's, it's draconian when your, your 18 year old son or daughter who's at Scripps or Pomona College or Pisa, it wouldn't take you long to understand how unjust it is when they've been sent off to prison for 15 years for possessing marijuana, two ounces of narcotics. So it was, this was my entree into uh, this work. I had written American Paradox, Young Black Men. The thesis of this book is that, you know, young black men wanted to be the illest, realest, killest, the ultimate gangster thug. And the consequences of this desire to keep it real had two death dealing consequences. One, they wound up in prison or dead. So when I transitioned to start working on prison race, I was in Sentinella State Prison. I was speaking, lecturing to the IYO program, the Incarcerated Youth Offenders Program. I spoke for 20 minutes and I opened the floor up for Q&A. There were 20 young men in this talk. And when I opened it up for Q&A, I said, my goodness, these young men could be where I am if they had better guidance, better mentorship. And quite frankly, it was Ralph Waldo Emerson who said that geography is destiny. Think about that. How poignant, how true can a statement be that geography is destiny? If they had grown up in my environment and not in these, these, these toxic, dangerous environments, they could be a professor, they could be a lawyer, they could be a surgeon. So geography is destiny. And then I started corresponding with some of these young men, writing with them. And I realized that they were just as brilliant as any of my students at Cal Poly Pomona. And that was my impetus to write Prison Race. And in Prison Race, at the back, I had this very quixotic, very idealistic idea. And it was just theoretical. It was just in the abstract that we could create a reintegration academy to bring parolees, recently released individuals to a college campus for 10 weeks. Put them on that campus so they can smell the flowers, see the trees, consume the energy of the college campus. Put them on there so they can see two co-eds holding hands under a tree. That might trigger them to say, hey, I want 
that life, not the life that I've had. And someone says, you're going to be naive and quixotic about this and idealistic about this. We're going to give you $15,000 for you to put your, put your mouth where this money is. And that's what we did. In 2009, we had the first reintegration academy, which was hosted at uh, Cal Poly Pomona. We're now two days away from hosting our 10th reintegration academy, which is now hosted at the perfect, most ideal home for this program, which is Pitzer College. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reese. And I know firsthand the importance of having that mentorship because that is exactly what helped to turn my life around. You know, you talk about geography and that's something that we can't help, right? We can't help where we're born. We can't help who our parents are, the neighborhoods that we grow up in. And so there has to come a point in time where we have to decide to be intentional. And I think that's exactly what I did. You know, I grew up seeing everything that I saw. I didn't know anyone that had gone to college. Uh, my parents had went to college. And so naturally I didn't think college was a place for me. So I finally went back to school, got that, that high school diploma. And I thought, okay, I could go out here and get a job, right? A good job. And I think we all know the realities of that, right? How far you get in society with only a high school diploma. And as a single parent, I got to the point where I got pretty desperate and I could totally see how people in desperate situations do desperate things. But for me, I thought, why not give college a shot, right? I was working two, three dead end jobs. I had thought I wanted to go into law enforcement and worked in law enforcement for a while and realized that, you know, whatever my thoughts were going into law enforcement, thinking I can get in there and change the system and realizing that I was hired to operate within a system that had already been created. You know, I was out there with, again, just that high school diploma. And so the best decision I ever made was to go to college, to start at the community college level and slowly begin to build myself up. As I did that, I found the mentorship that I needed. I found the guidance that I needed, the things that I had thought that I couldn't do before, I excelled in. And so I think you're right, Dr. Reese, it is about that guidance. It is about that mentorship. And so, you know, that's why as one of your students, when you talked about the prison education pro project and having this ideal and, you know, looking for students who would want to go and provide this additional educational support to incarcerated people, um, I think I might've been one of the first students to sign up for that program. Um, and have been excited every step of the way to really not only participate, but, but to give back in truly fundamental ways. And so I do wanna thank you for that. And Ty, if I could just uh, step in and just give you an overview of that. You were a part of the first group. This happened back in 2011. Uh, people think that you need million dollars in, in grants to go out and to make change. The Prison Education Project, PEP had no money in the very beginning. But what we had was we, we had this desire to be in the trenches, to be on the front lines, right? You have 34 prisons in the state of California. Nearly every prison has a community college and or a university within a 30 mile radius. The philosophy of PEP is to use the resources that you have in your backyard. We have students that know what they're majoring in. We know we have students that know how to add to multiply. We have, we have professors who, who, who know their discipline. So come on, let's go. Don't hold that to yourself. Don't hoard it. Let's go. Let's go expose a group of people who've never been exposed to, to much. Somebody gave up on them when they were in the first, second, and third grade. Now we have a chance to, to outreach to them. And I'm going to tell you about the power of teaching inside a correctional facility. You know, after having taught for 25 years, you, you get accustomed to, to students zoning out, whispering to each other. Uh, writing letters to each other, being on their cell phones, being on, uh, on, on Instagram or social media on their uh, laptop computers. When you go on the inside of a prison, your in custody students are hanging on your every word. And as someone who take, takes teaching, pedagogy seriously, there's nothing more powerful than having the responsibility of teaching someone 
who is waiting on your knowledge. They're hungry for your knowledge, right? And it's a spiritual experience on the inside. Those of you who are on this call, who've taught on the inside, you know it's spiritual. It's hard to explain. It's inexplicable when you come out and people say, oh, why you're in a prison? Why are you teach? You can't explain it, but it's powerful because it's a relationship that's based on reciprocity. It's a, a, a reciprocal reflex. So you go in to teach, but you learn just as much as you teach. They go in to learn, but they teach just as much as they learn. And then you have this gratitude loop where everybody is grateful, everybody is thankful, and it, it creates a sense of a, a, a magic on the inside, right? And so for, for our, now we've developed into the biggest prison education program of its kind in the United States. During the middle of COVID, we're in 16 correctional facilities, two facilities in Hawaii, one in Scotland, eight juvenile facilities. And the concept is still the same, Ty. And that concept is the volunteers come in with words, not money. And if words have been used to damage, words can be used to heal, to uplift, to inspire. I believe in you. You can do this. I have your back. I'm proud of you. And words, not money, words are the most powerful way to transform the internal human condition, not the external. But the internal human condition, how you feel about yourself, your self-esteem, your confidence. If somebody tells you you'll never amount to anything every day of your life, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But on the contrary, if someone tells you you're going to go to college, you're going to be great, you're going to be successful, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And Ty, the most important thing, the most powerful thing about words, and we don't think about this, is that they're free. The fact that we all have agency over our words. Think about how you feel when somebody says you're amazing. You're so amazing. Think about how you feel when somebody says, I'm so proud of you. Right? That's not money. That's, that's, that's words. So with the Prison Education Project, we go into all these facilities. We teach a range of 20 classes, right? Everything from physics to, to, to calculus, to engineering, to, to computer science, to Shakespeare, intro to college, in, intro to career development. But more than anything else, we let them know that we're there. We see you. More than anything else, we use the, the, these words to, to, to uplift, whether it's physics or whether it's Shakespeare, right? And so uh, this is, um, it's been an extraordinary journey uh, for, for the Prison Education Project. We've had programs, um, Tai, you were part of the first uh, group to go into CR, CIM, California Institution for Men, and you were a pioneer. You were the first group, part of the first group to go to Uganda. Uh, for four years, we had the biggest uh, prison education uh, program in Uganda. And again, over the last, I would say, eight years, Pitzer has been there along the way. When Pitzer says that social justice is at the cornerstone of their pedagogical framework, that's, that's not in theory. That's not in abstract. It, it's true. It was Nigel Boyle who came with us and, and volunteers, uh, Tessa and and Suchi from, from Scripps that came with us to Uganda to teach those classes. For four years, we had the biggest program on the continent of Africa. And so every step of the way, uh, Pitzer has been there, the Claremont Colleges have, have been there, and it's just been an amazing journey. And I would make the argument that, uh, Ty, that you know this new Biden administration, uh, criminal justice reform is in, gonna be in the top five agenda items. They're gonna scour, they're gonna, they're gonna canvas the entire uh, country. They're gonna start in you know, Florida, go to Georgia, Mississippi, Texas. They'll go through Oklahoma, they'll go to Arizona and they're looking for a model. And then when they come to California, they'll stumble upon what we've, what we've been doing over the last decade. Whether it's the Pistons BA program, the bachelor's program, first inside out bachelor's program in, in the country, whether it's the new resource new resource program at, uh, at Pitzer that funds uh, people who are adult, mature, who 
overcome challenges, including our formerly incarcerated population, whether it's the Prison Education Project, the Reintegration Academy, or now Project Rebound, which is a program that is in 14, on 14 CSU campuses, a program to support formerly incarcerated students, a program that is sponsored, signed off on by the governor with a $3.3 million, million dollar budget each year. So I've seen things change. I think California is the most progressive state in the United States when it comes to criminal justice reform. And I just, I, I, I'm proud to be in this state and I'm proud to see that change. We felt like we were swimming upstream for so long, but there are a lot of dynamic things that have happened in this, in, in this area over the last uh, decade. And I think what's so impressive about what we're doing is the fact that we have these in-prison programs like PEP there to support folks, because we always say that, you know, transformation and the work starts while folks are on the inside. And so we have PEP there to support them. We also have the outside component, which is the reintegration academy. Now, you know, teaching in prisons is definitely not easy, right? It's definitely not easy. It takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. But I will say that, you know, working with the reentry population is definitely a bit more difficult, right? Because, it, because they need more support. Um, and we just don't have enough programs like the Reintegration Academy that's there to support the reentry population. And so when you have someone who's there, who needs support, who needs housing, who needs all of these other important resources, that's when, you know, you really have to lift up your sleeves and dig in and start doing the hard work. And so it's some of the things that we are seeing now with our bachelor's degree program at CRC. We've had a couple of our students be released. And so now we're working to ensure that they are truly successful, recognizing that success is is more than just completing this degree, right? It's also ensuring that they have the tools that they need to transcend their background, to transform and give back because that's what so many of them want to do. And so I'm so grateful for the Reintegration Academy and PEP for providing that platform for, for folks. I, I, I agree, Ty, I, I agree with you and I could not agree with you more. You know, I think when we, when we talk about the next decade, the next frontier. I think that the next frontier is not just in custody uh, programming, it's what happens when they are released. And I've been critical that you have people all over from, from Boston College to Harvard and, and Cornell and all of these colleges going in, clamoring to get into the prisons, and they have their dinner party conversations. You know, they're drinking wine, they're eating cheese, and people are patting them on their back for how amazing they are. But the fact is, where are you when these people are released? That's when they need your help the most. You know, they can't call you, they can't email you, you can't, you know, you're, you're ghosts. So, you know, after having been a professor for so long, I'm accustomed to going to conferences and, 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 and many conferences and sitting on committees and steering committees. And everybody's talking about the problem, but few people want to really get in the trenches and do something about the solution. This is not, when you go inside, these, these, these individuals can look through your eyes and see to your soul. They know if you're a cultural tourist. They know if you just want to put something on your resume. And when they call you or try to get in touch with you on, on the outside, they understand that this is just an experiment, right? And so I think the new frontier is to galvanize the same energy that we've galvanized on the inside to go on the inside. Now let's rally around. Let's give some guidance. Let's give some, some support. Let's give some real mentorship when they need all of these different things. Let's give them a warm handoff when they come out. And so I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. And I think we have 15 minutes. Maybe we can entertain some questions tight. Absolutely. If there are any questions, go ahead and please feel free to type them in the chat. But you know, Dr. Reese, I think you're absolutely right. And one thing that I just want to use this quick moment to share with all of you is we will be doing a mentor training for our Reintegration Academy students tomorrow. 
um, from five to six. And so I will share more information for those of you that are interested in getting involved. Again, you know, the, the real work starts when folks get out and are there and need that support. They need that help filling out that job application, that FAFSA application, maybe uh, an application for school. They need support with interview questions and so many of the little things that the vast majority of us take for granted. They need that support, help with life skills, soft skills. And so that is exactly what the Reintegration Academy provides. And I'll, I'll just give you an overview of how we, we, we do this. So the Reintegration Academy works with the uh, Department of uh, the CDCR, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations, Division of Adult Parole Operations. And so what we do is we start out with a, a group, a pool of 500 uh, recently released uh, individuals from prison. And uh, we, we narrow those down. So all of the parole agents actually give us a list of three or four of uh, their referrals, uh, the people that they think would be best for this program. And so we get about 40 of those referrals. Uh, we interview those individuals and we try to uh, stay within about 35 to 40. We try not to disappoint people after the interview and say that they've not uh, made the cut. So we try to only interview the people that we're pretty certain will be uh, accepted and selected into this program. It's an eight-week program uh, now. Uh, those individuals pre-COVID, po post-COVID, they come to the college campus. And uh, one of the great things about coming to Pittsburgh's campus, you see all the succulents, uh, you see the grass is bucolic, it's, it's, it's pastoral. But one of the great features is, you figure in our last cohort, two, two cohorts ago in 2019, that was a lifer cohort. So out of 38 of those participants, 33, 33 of them had spent a life sentence. That meant over 15 years in prison. And so the, the main feature is when they went to the dining hall. And I remember this guy who had been in prison for 35 years, eating prison food for 35 years. He had just been out for a week. And uh, he was over at Pitzer, you know, getting out. And he ran up to me. He said, ah, Dr. Reese, Dr. Reese, they have steak. I said, I know. Go get your son. And then about five minutes later, he came up to me like, Dr. Reese, Dr. Reese, they have uh, chicken wings. They have shrimp. I said, go get it all, get it all. And so, <laughs> so that's one of the ways in which, that's, that's one of the ways we, 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 uh, we one of the ways we, we dealt with attrition. We didn't have uh, attrition because of uh, Pitzer's uh, dining hall. So kudos to uh, the dining hall at Pitzer. So Mace, to answer your question, uh, like Dr. Reese said, pre and post COVID, we will be back in person, but for this RA session, um, it will be virtual and the mentorship opportunity is also virtual. Thank you. Next question, as a volunteer stepping into a carceral setting, how do you find an appropriate balance between compassionately showing up for someone and over-promising? Well, for me, I don't think uh, when you say over promising, I think just showing up is uh, monumental. I remember this is at Mount Sac. This is about seven or eight years ago. And uh, the volunteer said, well, Dr. Reese, I'm, not, I'm shy. I don't like speaking, but I want to volunteer. What can I do? I said, come on, just, just show up. Your energy, you know, you're going to emanate. You're going to release some type of energy. So even if you're not saying one word, you being there, is gonna be transformative. And in the second week, that same volunteer was looking at one of our students trying to write notes and, and the student, the participants, their, their pen gave out. And this volunteer tapped him on the shoulder and gave him her pen. Now that might sound simple, but it, it was powerful, it was beautiful. And in the end, it's transformative because it's saying, I see you, I'm here for you. I have your back. It's symbolic. It's metaphorical. But basically, that's what it's saying. And so I don't, in terms of overpromising, just be careful about that. When you tell them that you're going to go out and get information on the horticulture program at Mount Sac, then go out and get information on the horticulture program at Mount Sac. The person says they want to be an integrated uh, pest control uh, management specialist. Let's go find information on that. All right? And that's all about being serious. You know, don't, 
if you come to the reintegration academy, just you, you don't want to just come in and just see all these people spent life in prison. And they've been in there for 20, 25 years. That's not what we're about. We're not cultural tourists. If you say you're going to do something, let's make sure you go and do it. That's what that's what has made us who we are at the Reintegration Academy and the Prison Education Project. Yes, and also just keeping your word lets them know that you're serious, right? Even if it is, like Dr. Reese said, just bringing in a piece of information, that really does go a long way. Next question, what is your recommendation for the best way to stay involved and engaged in these issues after graduation? Well, I graduated from Dr. Reese's program uh, almost a decade ago, and uh, I've remained engaged and involved by just showing up, right? These opportunities are out there. Uh, Dr. Reese will send out emails about the next cohort, the next volunteer opportunity, and I'm there. So it really is just about showing up. There's lots of programs and ways for you to engage. And so just know that graduating uh, doesn't mean that that's where you know, your activism and engagement should end. Let me, let me follow up. You know, one of, one of my main challenges and charges now is to really be invisible. You know, when I grew up in uh, Georgia, I grew up in a small uh, rural town. I went to a segregated uh, uh, kindergarten, Westside Training School for the Colors in uh, McDonough, Georgia. You know, when I grew up, we called it Five Miles, Georgia because it was five miles from the schoolhouse, five miles from the church house, and five miles from the store. And we were so far in the country, we didn't get Saturday Night Live until Tuesday night. <laughs> so, so, so when I grew up in five miles, I think this is when I first came in contact with segregation and race and all these different dynamics. But it's something that that just has propelled me. You know, I've been curious, intellectually curious, culturally curious about how to resolve these cleavages. How do we how do we resolve these particular issues? And in working in McDonough, I remember uh, being a janitor. And as a janitor at my uh, old, uh, I was at Vanderbilt, and I was just coming home in the summer, and we would buff the floors. Me, a guy named Pee Wee, a guy named uh, Lester High, and Goldfish. And after we buffed the floors, I don't know if you saw uh, Shawshank Redemption with uh, Red and Andy Dufresne. They were up on the, on the rooftop and they were just drinking coffee. So after we buffed those floors, we just sat back and we just marveled at how shiny those floors were. And then the next day, the next morning, people came in and they were totally oblivious. They walked on our floors. They were totally oblivious. They would have recognized if the, if the floors were, were dirty, if they had trash on them. But they didn't. So that's okay for us. It's just like a good referee in a basketball football game. It's, that's my charge is to be invisible, to get our volunteers in front of those in custody students. And that's when the magic occurs. And so for me, it's about creating these opportunities that are dynamic. Now we're in Hawaii, right? So we have two facilities in Hawaii. And if they don't have volunteers in Hawaii, that means geographically, we're the closest volunteers to, to, to those six prisons. And so once we claim those prisons, guess what? I'm taking a group of volunteers to Hawaii. We're going to volunteer on the inside and then they'll everybody have the rest of the day to, to, to do what they, what they want to do. We've done that in Uganda. We've done that in London. We've done that in Scotland. And we're going to do it in Hawaii. And as of uh, hopefully tomorrow, we're going to be doing it in Bermuda. Right. So I'm reaching out to someone, someone call, call me from uh, Bermuda and say, Dr. Reese, can you bring Pep out? I'm, we're out there. We're going to come virtually and then I'm bringing a group over. So I just think that it's, it's, it's organic and I think you have to stay true to the mission. You have to stay on the front lines. You got to stay in the trenches. And for me, that means being invisible. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reese. Um, and if I can just add, you know, for me, this is something that's just deeply embedded in me, something that I'm extremely passionate about, right? I mean, you know, growing up the way I did and seeing so many of the people that I love and care about end up in prisons, this is just my way to, to pay it forward, really, um, because that, that could have been me, right? I, I do recognize that. And so, 
for me, I'm going to continue doing this work um, until I can't do it anymore, um, like Dr. Reese. But any place that Dr. Reese is going, um, he knows all he has to do is call me up and um, I'm there. Bags are packed and I'm ready to go. Uh, and, and, and for people who want to get, I see Mace. Mace has been a warrior for us. And I took Mace on a study abroad trip to uh, Vancouver. And uh, I think what stands out, I know all of my students and their characteristics. I took uh, Tai on a, a study abroad trip to uh, Amsterdam when she was a student. But with Mace, what stands out is that when we got to LAX, she had like three suitcases. I don't mean like duffel bags. I'm talking about like, like 60 pound suitcases. And I remember telling her, look, you're gonna have to repack, put two of those suitcases into one. <laughs> she said, that's not a good look. <laughs> But but Mays, after that, that was an NGO and social service outreach class, but she came out, she'd been so committed to PEP, she'd been a warrior. Now she's in graduate school. I think uh, Mays is about to graduate from uh, graduate school at the University of Illinois, Urbana, but she's still involved, she's still engaged. And so uh, those of you who are interested, you have to put time in first and then we'll take you to some of these places. Uh, uh, and that's the reward. So it's not that you can go on and not that you can be eligible for a trip abroad unless you've already committed two semesters to this program. And it's a great motivator. I will say, you know, you travel with Dr. Reese. I've gone to, I think about what, five countries now with Dr. Reese. He knows everything about every place that we go and he is a stickler about those bags. And so because of Dr. Reese, I call myself the ultimate packer. I mean, I literally have a carry-on and a backpack. That's it, right? And I can make it work for three weeks. And so um, that's it. You know, you, you recognize that when you're doing this trench work, it's not much that you need. That duffel bag and that carry-on is, is perfect, right? Because uh, the reality is, is that we're really using our words. And like Dr. Reese said, when we go inside, we don't have access to PowerPoints. We don't have access to a lot of the fancy equipment that we use in college classrooms. We have access to our words and they're extremely powerful. Any other questions? We have about two minutes left. If not, I will turn it over to Dr. Reese for some closing remarks. I think, thank you, Ty. Uh, what runs, the, the, the thing that runs, the concept that runs through all of this work is the concept of Ubuntu, which means humanity. It means I am because we are. It's a South African term. And I remember going to Emory University and meeting with Bishop Desmond Tutu, the great social civil rights, social justice activist. And I remember going to South Africa. And when I was in Gukuletu and Langa and Crossroads, I remember people had no running water. People living off of one dollar a day, one out of four women infected with HIV AIDS. And I remember asking, how do you live? How do you survive? How do you keep your head up? How do the kids play soccer in the fields? And the guy said, Umbutu. And I said, Umbutu, tell me about it. He said, Umbutu means when my neighbor is hungry, I feed him. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. Umbutu is brotherhood, is sisterhood, is community. And whether we believe in God, Allah, Buddha, the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, Mother Nature, Yahweh. When it's all said and done, somebody's gonna hold us accountable for what we did down here. Not how many degrees we have, not what type of house we lived in the suburbs, not what type of car we drove, but how we loved. And I always say that we're separate as the five fingers, but we're one as the hand. Umbutu, I am because we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reese. This has been wonderful. And thank you so much to the Racial Justice Initiative at Pitzer College and the Justice Education Initiative for hosting this event. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>